my name is Arturo Farrell. I'm the founder and artistic director of the Afro Latin Jazz Lines. I want to welcome you to La Plaza at the Digital Village. Five years ago, on Friday, July 31st, 2015, I was invited to participate in a concert in Philadelphia at Temple University that uh, was one of the great highlights of my musical life. I was invited to perform, uh, compose, and uh, spend time with uh, an Afro-Brazilian uh, genius named Lechieres Lieche and his incredible orchestra, Orchestra Rumpilés, and perform at Temple University. Um, I had the privilege of, of witnessing firsthand one of the great, great minds of our musical minds of our time. And um, I looked at him and I looked at this orchestra and I thought, my God, this is my soul, my, 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 my spirit. I felt so connected to this man and the work that he does, tracing Afro-Brazilian roots of, of, of the music that he writes. Um, it was an extraordinary experience. And on top of that, I got to share that experience with a frequent co-conspirator of mine that is an amazing composer, arranger himself, and an incredible trumpet player, slide trumpet player, and just a musical raconteur, the great Steve Bernstein. Um, this led to collaboration that has lasted to this day, and uh, we have the privilege of inviting Master Leotier is to join us at the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra at Symphony Space in a concert called Rhythm Connections Brazil and Cuba. Please stay uh, tuned in tonight. After the concert, there will be a, a wonderful conversation between myself, uh, Steve Bernstein, J. Michael Harrison of RTI Radio, and Julia Lopez of Jazz uh, Connections, in the Philadelphia Jazz Project. Um, it's truly an honor for me to be able to present this concert for you. Please enjoy Maestro Letieres Lieche and Orchestra Rumpiles. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Letieres Leche and Orchestra Rumpiles. Now, I, I want to invite the, another good friend for 1,500 years, friend. Yes, about. <laughs> okay, I just say the name. Arturo Opeo. Opeo. Arturo, Arturo, é here. Composition this uh, I make it for one man uh, for my uh, teacher on life and music. His name is Anunciação. Uh, pioneer, pioneer, no? pioneer. And the fusion between Afro Brazilian music and the jazz. Antonio Ferreira Anunciação is drama. Okay. You play now Anunciação. Thank you. 
Next tune, and is the composition upon Arturo Pai. You can speak about your music. Okay. Um, when I first, uh, I gotta tell you, this really quickly, because I know that we can all speak, but uh, the vibe backstage is so beautiful. And you can't play music like this unless you're filled with love and wonder. <laughs> I'll tell you now. And courage, because what the Chattis does is difficult. So he's a hero, and all of these musicians are heroes, because keeping 24 musicians, 25, 26, 28, 30, 35 musicians is impossible, man. It's impossible. And the Chattis is doing that. I know. I have an orchestra. And I'll tell you, it's impossible. And so really, these guys are heroes, and we got to thank deeply. We thank the creator for the Chattis and Orchestra Rompiles. And the last thing I have to say is, I, didn't re I thought this was a rave. <laughs> I thought this was a rave. I'm sorry. I wrote a piece of jittery <laughs> electronica dance music. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Now you play Intruso.
Arturo, CEO em Bahia, CEO em Bahia. I'm Stephen Bernstein, I'm a trumpet player and a composer, and I've been asked to be a guest artist with the Chiaris. I wrote a piece of music for the orchestra, and I'm playing one of their compositions with them. My name is Arturo Farrell, I'm a pianist, composer, educator, and uh, I'm a, in, the same, uh, in the same position I'm here as a guest and a composer as well for the group. I had never heard my piece. I had written it. And the thing about, do, do these people out there know who Lecheris is and what this music is? Maybe we should tell them. But anyway, this music is for, this is incredible music, five candomblé percussionists. Candomblé is a Afro-Cuban Brazilian religion. And what, and 14 horns, 15 horns? Yeah, it's 24 musicians all told on stage. And, and uh, it's really 
I've never heard anything like this. I've heard a lot of music, we play a lot of music, and it's just because of the condom blade, because it's religious drumming, and it's five religious drummers, and they're from different sects too, so there's a lot going on. So when I wrote this piece, they added their drum rhythm, and I didn't know what that was, so I realized it took till today to kind of understand, not even understand, no, to even begin to hear what the drumming was doing. You know? Right. It's very, it's incredible. I mean, that's a beautiful thing about music. It doesn't matter what you're playing. If you're playing music, you're playing music. But having an opportunity like this just makes me just realize, wow, just like I said, the, the blessing of this whole thing. This is, uh, is a, a really interesting musician because he's very, uh, very much a trained musician, trained in Austria, in the conservatory. So he has the whole uh, Western European voicing harmony and stuff down pat, but he's also deeply uh, part of the Afro-Brazilian world. So he understands that not only because it's not rhythms we're talking about, we're talking about religions and there's a there's a whole lifestyle that is part of the religious observance of Afro uh, folkloric uh, religious life and he knows that stuff and so it's really amazing there's not many people on the planet who can seamlessly blend those worlds quite as well as the yeah, it's, it's Inconceivable. I don't think anyone's because because many people study European harmony and get really good at it. It's science. It's not really that difficult. It takes time. That's all. And Afro-Cuban, Afro-Brazilian, this this kind of religious life is something that people often do. It's not a big deal. You do it like anything. It's just like being Methodist, whatever. It's a religion. But those people, it's such. It's a, not quite like being Methodist. Well, I never met a Methodist. I mean, I don't even know what a Methodist is. I just said it because we're. Is this whole thing, is this Methodist? I don't know. It's more like Episcopalian, okay, I think. Well, they, you know, Afro-Episcopalian. Don't, don't get me in trouble, because I've been in trouble a lot if I talk about religion. But the point is, often that kind of people in that religion stay within a very kind of rural setting. Yeah. Not all the time, but that's kind of where that stuff lives. So to have both happening is... Whew. It's really different in Africa, because Africa is, does not mark time like we do. In Western Europe and America, we really have a tendency to mark time with fixed events. Consequently, our music is very beat-oriented, pulse-oriented, measure-oriented. Africa, life is a lot more circular. These rituals take months and years and whole lifetimes to understand. So rhythm is seen as a much broader entity. I think that the rhythm of daily life is kind of like this. It's not, oh, in 12 minutes I have a dentist appointment. It's like, oh, after the shepherds bring their sheep into the village and after I see the tinsmith be, make the cowbells, then I know I have a meeting, right? And that's a really different concept because, and that's the way music should be, I think. I think the beautiful thing about what Latiris and other people who do this is, is that I don't, I don't think music was ever meant to be this. You know, I think music was always meant to be this beautiful circular bubble of life. Otherwise, why listen to why, music? No, otherwise, why would people leave their houses and get off their little Facebooks to do it? Right. If we didn't actually transform them. Music isn't about playing music. Music is about transforming the people who have come to hear you play music. That's really our job. <laughs> now, I want you to buy it. I'm a very good friend for, I know him. Five, five years, five days, five days, about five days. But it's like hundred years. I want you to invite off the stage to play with us. Shivin Bernstein. <laughs> Shivin. And composition does uh, arrive for a uh, beautiful goat. The name is Oshossi. And composition is it's called Floresta Azul. Woo! Blue Forest. Thank you. 
Chilling, Bernstein. Now we play one tune. Now you play an, compos an composition from Shiving. You can speak about your composition later. Since it's English, right? I just uh, maybe New York and Philly. It's pretty close to the English language here, right? So, because they got about 15 languages to speak on this stage. Yes. But I got to just tell you something about this incredible band, and not that you you already know it, but I just have to tell you about my personal experience, why I'm here. I, a year ago, I was on the road, and uh, traveling musicians, it's not a bad life if you're working. I always tell people, it's okay not to have a job as long as you're working. Yes. You dig? So I was working in Germany, I had a day off, and this bus pulls up to this kind of crazy free jazz hippie festival. And out come all these dudes. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And then one last guy walks out, about six, seven. It's a guy I grew up with in California. And, uh, and I looked at him, I said, Eric. He goes, yeah, man, I got this incredible band. And you know, they get the bus. and. Trumpet players, we have a spoken language that goes beyond the trumpet. And let's just say these guys had come from Amsterdam. So we had a fantastic conversation in our third language <laughs> that we share. And uh, we all got to know each other. It was a beautiful thing. And I got to talk to Lefieres. He's talking about, and this band comes on. And, and I've heard a lot of music in my life. And my mind was just blown, as I'm sure you've all been blown by this incredible music, right? This is some incredible music. Thank you so much for sharing this music with us, all of you. This entire incredible orchestra, every one of you, thank you so much. So anyway, Latiris asked me to play a piece of music, and in my head, I imagine what this band would sound like if it was playing something I wrote. So now we get to hear what that is. Vision One.
Steve Bernstein, a trompete. João Teoria. João Teoria. Oh. Eh. Another trumpet player. Guilherme Giga Scott. Joatã Nascimento. Rudinei Machado. Well, listen, it's truly a, uh, a pleasure to reconvene yes. uh, a, a wonderful group of uh, incredibly talented folks that um, were instrumental in making a phenomenal evening in Philadelphia happen before. Uh, you know, Philadelphia being the, the birthplace of so many and the first of so many uh, different entities to have uh, Grupo Lee's perform here in Philadelphia for the first time in the United States about five years ago was a special night for us um, here in Philadelphia and everybody that was able to attend. But it's also great to know that there's efforts that are, are taking place uh, as we can be today to continue to celebrate that evening and celebrate that tour and expose what was, you know, again, a phenomenal presentation to uh, additional folks. So it's great to have, again, this assembling. Um, you know, when, when I look at a Toro and, and Steven, not only do I see beautiful people, but personally, you know, I just want to take a second and thank you guys because both of you have sto spoken to my students at the University of the Arts in the past. Right. Toro, you did it here at the station. Steven, you did it after a performance at the Painted Bride Arts Center here in Philadelphia. And I want to thank you guys for that. That was really, really tremendous, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's beautiful, man. Talking to young people is probably the very, very best thing I get to do in my life. Mm -hmm. Julia, you know, we go back for a minute, like beans and rice for sure, you know? Yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, you worked on so many different okay. levels here in Philadelphia to bring the arts to the people. And it's great to have your participation today. And looking forward to, to, to your comments. And it's always great to have you. And Eric, you know, you tried to ditch on us, but we wouldn't let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, again, I, I thought it would be important for you to, to add additional perspective to, as I mentioned, what was a really phenomenal undertaking, a phenomenal presentation that I think, you know, reverberated far beyond the Temple University's campus in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. really a, a spectacular presentation. And maybe you can take us back to the embryonic stages of how this all came about. Um, sure. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to kind of be here and uh, I well five years ago and, and and this is being broadcast on July 31st which is literally the five-year anniversary of when this performance took place uh, in Philadelphia uh, at that time I was still living in Brazil in Bahia and, and had been working with with orchestral Humpilés and with Lecieres for a number of years and uh, particularly in terms of, of putting together projects to get them into the international marketplace. And, and we had done a tour, a European tour, and, and we managed through collaborations with a number of presenters, including the folks at Temple, to raise money to do what was the debut tour. And frankly, to this point, it's the, the only time that 
Orchestra Hupiles has been able to tour North America. Wow. And um, this was, uh, it, it took probably, I'd say it took two or three years to put the whole thing together. And I was, you know, when we got, when it got to be real and we started looking at, okay, one of the things I felt was important was to find collaborators who shared the same spirit and some of the same musical adventurism and the same uh, deep uh, 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 love and interest in, in the roots of African music and Afro-Brazilian music and religious music. And um, I happened to, upon the Arturo and the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra, uh, when we were visiting New York and, and they were doing a performance together with John Santos. And I had seen John the week before in San Francisco and he told me about the gig and I said, we got to see these folks. And upon seeing the Afro-Latin Jazz Orchestra, I, I was like, this is like all the same similar vibes to Orchestra Bupilés and what Leche Eddies is doing. And, and Arturo has actually described himself as being, you know, uh, a, 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 I'll let him describe himself in, in terms of how he, he his relationship with Lechietti's. But the moment we saw the, the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra on stage, we said we have to find a way to somehow make the collaboration happen. And so I knew at that point I wanted to we wanted to invite our tour to take part, and he graciously agreed to do so. And the following year, we were in the summer, we were in Europe with Rupilés at the Moors Festival. And I and I won't go into all the detail of, of the story, but I hear I hear my name being called and I turn around and I see Steve Bernstein, who happened we happen to know each other from way back in, in elementary school days in Berkeley. And, and we and he was performing the next day, and so uh, we he started hanging out with the, with the folks in the orchestra, and he saw the show, and we started talking, and I told him that about Arturo being involved. He said, "Oh yeah, Artie and I go back many years, and, and the whole the thing just all started to come together, and it was a, an amazing privilege and a pleasure that that." All of these amazing folks, yourselves in Philadelphia and Arturo and Steve, all kind of became part of this thing. And it was just, it was like a wild adventure uh, to have Orchestra Hupilés touring 25 Bayano musicians and production people around the U.S. for two weeks. And the, the Philadelphia show, the two shows actually that Arturo and Steve participated in, which were New York and Philadelphia, were just real highlights, just to, to be able to be part of bringing that amazing music uh, to to the audiences here and bringing Arturo and Steve into into that collaboration and and it has evolved because now five years later I've been you know I've been working with Arturo and the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra for over three years and and just have enjoyed um, uh, many amazing opportunities of doing similar types of work and, and similar types of collaboration. So, you know, to be able to now, now we're in a situation where everything we do is online and we dipped into the archives and found, you know, came back across these videos, which we have two weeks, two videos we'll show tonight, this Friday, the 31st, and then tomorrow, the next Friday as well. It's just a real pleasure. And, and, uh, you know, I'm going to let you guys take over because I've pretty much talked enough, I think, as it stands. Maybe that gives a little bit of a context and a preface to how we got here. Yeah, no, it's important, I think, that you share that with everybody just to give additional context to how this developed. Um, before I turn uh, uh, Toro and Stephen loose, uh, Julia, I want to bring you in. Um, you know, the next phase of that was the Philadelphia Jazz Project um you know connecting with uh folks like us here at wrti and and so forth i mean if you can talk about the sure. excitement one of of being involved with um sure. such a huge uh you know ordeal but also you know just what it means to you to look back on, on what was you know, again so special um the first thing i have to say is just to set this up because you know, I, you know, I did, you know, I've worked, I worked with the Philadelphia Jazz 
uh, project. It was me, Melissa Tally Palmer, and of course, Homer Jackson um, that actually sat us down and said, hey, I want, you know, I got some funding, let's do this jazz project thing, you know, the Philadelphia Jazz Project. Thing. And so um, within, the, within those years, uh, just to put this in context in terms of how I feel about Umpiles, <laughs> is uh, that, like for instance, the first year of our work together with the Jazz Project, we, and I was the, the, the manager that contracted the artists and, and then did all the backstage stuff. We, we contracted over 1,300 artists within the first year of our programming. So, and then, and then uh, just for five years, like all these different concerts and with like, I don't even know how many concerts, I can't even remember, it's just, oh, and how many artists, it's gotta be over 2,000 artists that we worked with. And I put, I lay that down as the foundation, but the highlight, the highlight of those five years for me was working with the artists and just all of the ins and outs of what had to happen to make this concert uh, uh, happen was with Humbiles. Like that stays in my mind because what it did was also stretch my muscles, you know, stretch my, you know, uh, working with artists muscles, stretch my muscles working with Temple University and their food services <laughs> and, and anything that came up uh, to make sure that when, when Rumpiles landed, that their experience was gonna be like top notch. It was going to be an experience that they will know, you know, learn about Philadelphia and Philadelphians and the and the the music community and arts community here in the city. So uh, for me, it really was like the highlight of my music production and also just as an artist myself, you know, uh, of my career. It really, really was. You know, that's that's great to hear. And, and thank you for sharing that. Um, on so many levels for Stephen and Arturo, um, you know, first of all, you know, Lecherez is, is such a charismatic figure. Um, his energy is, is so phenomenal. And, you know, to be so well versed in you know, European music, but also, you know, folkloric music, um, from Africa, and, you know that that mix of, of being so again so accomplished. Um, he's a special talent. So for the two of you coming to this project, I mean, if, if maybe you can give a little perspective about your thoughts prior to the performance, and you know maybe that night as well, Arturo, if you will. Sure. Um, I um, was. I've, I was raised in big bands. My father was a composer and arranger. And the narrative of a big band is that you have 20 or 30 crazy, crazy people, all like psychotic and all psychotic in their own different way. So for me, like to grow up and grow up around Count Basie and Thad Jones and uh, to grow up around those people, I thought that everybody lived like that <laughs> you know so I, I was there was no way I it was inescapable for me to not not want to surround myself with big band musicians my whole life and so with the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra it's just an extension of that vehicle to make music but I had a different concept for the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra I wanted it to be really pan Latin pan African uh, unique, contemporary, able to play anything from Randy Weston to Vijay Iyer, to be able to play music of India, music of the future, music. We even have had an occasion to jam with a horse. So uh, we've we've gone we'll into. We'll come back to that another time. We've got we've got we've gone interspecies at this point, <laughs> but I never. And one of the first things I did was kind of decided that I like the models of, of Machito and Duke Ellington in their first way that they had the band layout. Because to me, the traditional stack is very compact and it's great for the musicians, but the audience hears all the horns kind of coming at them from one 
direction. Whereas Machito, the early Machito and early Duke Ellington bands had this, the horn separate, sections separated. And I thought that was a much more natural experience. And if you were a fan or if you were listening carefully, you wanted to hear the differentiation between trombones playing in a section and trumpets uh, doing uh, pyramids. You really wanted to hear that. That was interesting to me. So the first thing I did when I started the African Jazz Orchestra, I shaped it like a flying V with the trumpets in front, in the back, in the top row, then the trombones to the stage left, and the trum and the trumpets to the stage right, and the rhythm section, and most importantly, the conga, and the conguero, and the bongocero, and the drums right smack dab in the center. And I thought that was something that I had made up. I, I kind of copied from Count Basie, if not from Duke Ellington or... Uh, and then I saw Orchestra from Biles, <laughs> and I thought I thought the idea of also just being Pan Latin, having Pan African, real African rhythms permeate your 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 music, and to actually study these things, and to come from specific, you know, Moroccan rhythms and Ghanaian rhythms and West Indian rhythms, uh, all that stuff I thought was really my invention. And then I met from Biles and the Jadis, and I realized, hey, what Eric was saying earlier. I have a doppelganger. He's somebody who's as nuts as I am somewhere in the world who has just absolutely no, no, people haven't learned to say no to him either. You know? So when I, when, when Eric invited me, for the first thing I did was meet these guys in rehearsal. And I went, wow, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And then to hear that music played with such an authenticity and not like a, Brazilian, uh, slick down kind of Brazilianized, Brazilian-ish, brazilian uh, thing, but candomble, like rhythms. I'm talking about like rhythms from the real, real, for real Brazil. And to hear that and to hear that and then to hear on top of that the wonderful, because the other thing about the Chietis is not just um, Brazil, but just genius, just amazing composition just to hear the, just to hear his spirit soar on top of this uh, utterly uh, uh, authentic sound and then finally I mean uh, getting to play uh, with these guys they're all master musicians especially the percussionists and then I had the biggest um, just such a beautiful honor to write to compose uh, for that band and to compose something, and so in my mind, when I composed the piece, uh, I thought about the idea of Afro-Brazilian and, and, and Afro-Latin marching bands. And what would happen if you saw a marching band out on the field, on the football field, and all of a sudden they went Afro-Brazilian? <laughs> you know, all of a sudden they were like, oh, hell broke loose, and the trombones started going, bah! Bad, 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 and the rhythm section is screaming and yelling, and people are going nuts. And that's that, that, that I thought was such a beautiful opportunity to hear some insanity of mine realized uh, by these wonderful, wonderful musicians who I, I absolutely adore. It's beautiful, man. Well, you know, I'm going to give you an opportunity for a shameless plug here um, because I, you know, I went back and I, I listened to your your piece and that performance that night and you know it, early on into the piece it made me think of where where your current recording is you know <laughs> <laughs> i felt it i'm like whoa yeah, yeah this is a little 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 feel for where your current stuff is yeah yeah i am um, i i i can see that because the, the piece that i i, I contribute is called blood in the water and uh and and it I, I, you know i love that i love percussive brass i love brass that i love brass that thinks it's drums and i love drums that sing like they're brass so, you know what i mean so to me that's a that that's kind of what guided the four questions the piece yes. that i wrote for dr cornell west that's the same it's the same way and i tell that to my musicians when we're rehearsing it, i say to them think don't think don't 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 think don't think like a trumpet player. Think like a drummer. And then I go to my rhythm section and I go, D -d 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 don't play the drums. Sing the drums. And of course, they, you know, they look at me like I'm absolutely nuts. 
is what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, that's beautiful, man. And and that, that again, you know, that presentation at E that you brought forth was um, extraordinary. It just fits so perfect with you know such an extraordinary. It was so, a priv- it was a privilege, and I thank uh, Julia and Eric and Steve, uh, and you for allowing me that moment in my life. It's a huge, huge privilege. You know, Steve, Stephen, you, you told me before we got started, you got a lot of new music to get to me. Man. Well, so I'm and, looking forward. And it's so funny because you know I have so many narratives in my head, in my person, my blessing. That's why I have six CDs right now with Arturo on a couple of tracks that I just thinking about this and like but for the first time with Millennial Territory Orchestra which has all, always been kind of a bit of a band that it, uh, it explored other music by other music I love but seen through my lens for the first time I wrote a whole CD of original music and it was all I realized it's all coming from what I heard not all but I was trying to figure out what this music is because I wrote this music that's never, there's no way to say what it is. And so much of it is coming from that experience of, of feeling Rumpelezen's, the energy of that rhythm and a way to kind of take this big band thing. I mean, it's interesting Arturo's narrative because my father was not a big band composer genius. He was a doctor, but I grew up in big bands. My teachers were two of the greatest big band trumpet players lead trauma players in history. Now, as Arturo can tell you, a guy like Arturo thinks he's the leader of a big band. He's not. The first trumpet player is the leader of a big band. That's and it's actually the first trumpet player whose philosophy creates the sound of the big band. So when That's you're correct. when you're studying with people like this as a young person, you're not just studying trumpet. You're studying musical philosophy. And so I was raised in the musical philosophy of Duke Ellington, the musical philosophy of Fletcher Henderson, the musical philosophy of Thad Jones. That's the philosophy I was given from like 14, 15 years old on. At the same time, growing up in Berkeley, alongside Eric Toller, there was an amazing family, the Engelhart family, that I spent a lot of time at their house. And they would spend two months a year in Brazil. The father was a musician. And they picked up records that you couldn't get in America. So from early high school, and pe- people would be at their house. So you would meet Gismonti at their house. You'd meet Ayerto and Flora at their house. But you also had access to music that usually would not be accessed, like early Gismonti records. And I don't know if you've heard, have you ever heard Gismonti's like fusion records? Yes. Yeah, they're unbelievable. Yes. And all the Milton records and Trio Electrico and all the Samba records and all this stuff. So I always had those rhythms inside of me. Now, growing up as we are now 21st century people, we have all these narratives going on. So I've always been this narrative of the Afro-Brazilian drums. Now, I did not know at the time it was Afro-Brazilian. I just knew it as Brazilian. But... Uh, it was something that's been in my DNA now for over 40 years. And so when I saw Eric in that bus and I went in and heard Rumpelez, it was the first time I'd heard big band music played with Afro-Brazilian drums. Now, uh, there's an amazing s- history of 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 Cuban music written by Ned Sublet called, what's it called? Cuba and its music. Right. Now, it's a very kind of horrible story about why the African drum tradition is so alive in, in Brazil. And that is in Cuba. Because in America, it was slave trade. Uh, and at a certain point, they stopped the slave trade and it became slave breeding. And in Brazil and in Cuba, they just worked the slaves until they died and brought in new slaves after America stopped and just kept breeding. So what that meant was the influence from Africa, the new it was imported for a longer time into Cuba and Brazil, which means the drum tradition kept being reinvigorated. So that's the difference when you hear music from 
the drum music from those places, those countries. So when you see the Candomblé drums in the middle of that orchestra, it was just mind blowing to me. I mean, literally mind blowing. I, it's like kind of like, wow, I've been waiting my life to hear this. And um, yeah, so when, when Eric asked me to, you know, to write a piece, it was just this incredible opportunity for me because you can't really write pieces like that because there's no, you don't have a chance to. There's no, that's the only orchestra in the world that does that. And in fact, there was a very interesting situation when I wrote a piece for Arturo's band and it did something which we call Cross and Clave. Now, I had played, been playing the piece for about 15 years, close to 20 years, and all the musicians I had played with were not traditional drummers. So they all just played the melody. And if you played the melody, it was very clear what happened. But if you keep clave in your head and you don't, can't let go of it, and it was the most, I had never, it was the first time I'd been in that situation where I would, these guys were like, I had to keep telling them, no, you have to let go of the clave. Just listen to where the melody is and it'll tell you exactly because it's a situation where the melody, it's something we use in pop, American pop music for a long time where you either elongate or you retract a phrase by one bar, which creates a rollover. But if you do that in that one bar, that one bar cuts the clave in half. So ba ba ba. what am I getting to with this? What I'm getting to this is rhythm. So when I wrote this piece for Rumpelez, in my mind, I was hearing, Lettiere said to me, write the piece, I'm gonna do with it what I'm gonna do. And that was a beautiful freeing moment because I knew like it wasn't up to me to complete the piece. It was me to give them raw material. And in my head, I was hearing it. And in my head, certain sections I was hearing, cause it was a bit, uh, it was kind of written like in an A, B, C, D, E form, right? Like that, cross. I think it goes back to A. I think eventually it went back to the original theme. But um, I was hearing 6-8 in certain sections and 4-4 four, four in certain sections in my head. And when I get to rehearsal, it was exactly the opposite. So it's just so interesting, like how in my head, I was hearing the rhythms one way and Lecieris, and again, is it because of the traditional way of hearing it? Is it because of the genius way of hearing it? Is it because now is exactly what happens? We don't even question what it is, but it was a really, it was an unbelievable thing to see like, wow, everything I heard in my mind imagining a 6-8, I heard a 4-4, four, four, and everything I heard imagining a 4-4, a four, four, I heard a 6-8. And it, again, it was one of these things where you just realize how expansive music is and, and how collaboration can open up so many things. Yeah, well, you know, again, man, you know, much as, as I mentioned with Atoro, you know, the presentation of, of your selection was, you know, again, man, it was breathtaking. It was beautiful, it was phenomenal amidst, you know, again, an entire night that was just unforgettable. You know, you stood out as well. And I appreciate, you know, your efforts, man. I think it came across especially well with that ensemble. Thank you. So that, was, that was really, you know, really you know, great. And for me, um, it's so, it's so crazy because we did a, uh, in a time before Zoom calls, we did a, a conference call um, with, with Leche Eres. And uh, we, we, somehow, Eric, we got him, we got him on the phone from, I, I guess he was in Bahia at, at the time, but we were able to have this conversation. Uh, um, and I think uh, Bill Johnson was in on that. Homer was in. Lee, I don't know if you were in on that. Arturo, I don't think you were. But, you know, just uh, the energy that was building from that, that conversation is so special. Now, as a, a fan of the music, I had an idea. I saw some videos. And I, I had an idea of what to anticipate that evening. But, you know, it's nothing like the real deal and being there in person and, and seeing all of these guys dressed in white, you know, some white tuxedos and, uh, you know, it was, it was so spectacular. Um, and then Pablo Batista opened up with 
a, a you know a, a really nice Blakey presentation with a uh, a large ensemble as well. So that experience that evening um, may be Eric a once in a lifetime experience um, for those folks that got a chance to witness that here in Philadelphia and maybe New York as well. Yeah, and I just want to add like, you know, we the audience too, I think that they had no idea what they were going to experience. I think they knew it was something, you know, that they hadn't heard of before, like this this orchestra. Um, but you know, I knew I, I knew quite a few people in the audience because we generated, you know, we we sent out all those invitations. We we partnered with the schools with people that, you know, had other, you know, had ac you know, had access to students and all of that good stuff. And it was uh, just, it was just like, it was just like an energy explosion of just sheer, like discovery, but joy and, and just, just incredible. And the feedback that I got from just people who, you know, knew me directly and the called me and even after like the show was over and just the buzz and just the energy was just so like I mean beautiful it was just beautiful and it's almost like the first time you eat ice cream in your whole entire life you know what I mean or you know what I mean it's like what is this what's happening to me you know <laughs> and um, and for me that was just like and working with uh, with the art you know just with uh the artist backstage, you know what I mean? And just the flow of just the energy and uh, Lechiere is just being really cool. You know, he's just like cool, chill, chill. And I was like, okay. And he just like, you know, and, and we didn't, you know, I didn't speak the language or anything like that, but it was just like, I, you know, I was like, oh, cool. Okay, cool. You're good. You know, um, it was just, uh, just, just, uh, yeah, it was just amazing. I just, uh, I just, I, I can feel like those emotions coming back right now. As we uh, begin to wrap up, you know, maybe for for you guys looking back on that night, uh, you know, you, you gave some description, but uh, you know, again, just to to have that opportunity on that night with that incredible ensemble. You know, just maybe some brief reflections on on where it is with you now. It's funny. I revisited uh, that video, and it's funny. We the 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 performance at, at Temple was really different from the one at Lincoln Center. Uh, the Lincoln Center one is out of doors, and it's it was it's. Uh, it, it, it's it's much harder to control the sound out of doors. It's a much it's a but the 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 thing at Temple felt like much more intimate to me. And when you're dealing with that many drummers and you're a piano player, you just never know what to expect because it's piano players have to be part of the rhythm section, but they also have the harmonic business to take care of. Um, but I remember feeling. It just it completely at ease within that many drummers and feeling like not only did I not have to look for a space to play, but I, I found that uh, that I was, I felt very at home, which I felt really weird about. And it had to do with that audience, that room that night. And it had to do with this, it's a beautiful hall. It felt incredibly, just so different because it just I don't know and Lincoln Center was lovely too I had a lovely time in Lincoln Center but I just I, I just remember smiling uh, because I felt so I felt so organic it felt so natural and organic and and it just fit like a like a hand in glove and you know I don't think Lechiet has, has or ever had a piano in his ensemble and I was also worried about that um, and I, it just, maybe it's because of the way we think, but I felt like, I felt like I just settled into a, a new home with a new family and I'm, and it has to do with you guys. It has to do with Philadelphia because when you talk about Philadelphia, you have to cross yourself three times because this is a holy music town. 
Just letting you know, you got to cross. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's a holy music town. (laughs) When you say Philly, you got to go like this. You got to say Philly, because Philly is sacred, 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 sacred. Not not just because of history and legacy, but even because of the young musicians coming out of there now and the great, great, great tradition of supporting uh, jazz and, 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 and that you guys take such beautiful care of us and and for that we're very grateful and uh, i'll just i'll never forget that well thank you for those kind words and you made the ballot for mayor next, uh, <laughs> you're on the list you're nominated my friend uh philadelphia loves a tour uh, yes so no but thank you thank you for that and yeah. uh, you know and, and, and it, it's so great to hear that your experience was so phenomenal yeah um, it was it was special um, Stephen, for you, man, just reflections of that night, um, you know, I, it's five years later. Yeah, it's, it was very interesting also because it was the second night we all knew each other as humans more, and that same thing, we were all sharing the space. So it felt much more like you're getting on stage with family. I can actually remember the feeling, because the stage was, there were so many people, you kind of had to weave through the musicians yes. to yes. walk on stage. But it was like you were weaving through your family now because we'd spent like now three or four days together. And also, if I'm, if I'm kind of correct, I think the food was brought in by like friends, right? Didn't you have like food that was like neighborhood food? I kind of got this feeling of like, I remember like people bringing food in, it was homemade food. Is that true or my imagining? Yeah, we had, yeah, we had some food excursions, like some, yeah, I don't remember, I remember, we're trying to do it with with Temple, a uh, Mike, uh, uh, Michael. I, you know, I was. I think we ended up. A, yeah. It was I such a remember, I remember night. feeling like it was church lady food. <laughs> like, I think you know, that, yeah, we had to, yeah. yeah. And, and like, and so, and I, I, I mean, I could be, you know, sometimes I'm mixing things up in my head, but I just kind of remember these like nice older ladies bringing big pots of food. I do. And that, that kind of feeling always makes a big difference. Yeah. You know, because as people like Artie and I who travel for, used to travel for a living, and you show up and and you just, you know, the hospitality situation has a lot to do with the performance mm-hmm. yeah. because it's the, the vibrations that are created, you know, here's the vibrations. Are they family vibrations? Are they corporate vibrations? And they all work, you know, because that's our job is to make it work. But I remember feeling very family and of course, Philly's famous for that. My most of my work in Philly has been at the Painted Bride, and which was always a very kind of family situation as well. And they always would bring in food from like you know somebody would cook up some food and bring up some pots of food for you at Painted Bride as well. And um, that's just kind of what I, rem- I rem- remember that feeling of like okay, the first show was like that. Oh yeah, outdoors at Lincoln Center, catered by Zay Bars, blah blah blah. And it was also the first show. And then, so we're just kind of like getting that thing. And then the show of Philly was like, oh, family time, you know? And, you know, uh, I think I think that um, because uh, the jazz, the Philadelphia Jazz Project, we're a small, you know, we're a small group of people working together. You know what I mean? And and so that we, and we also knew each other from before, before the Jazz Project got together. So it's like, and we have like an incredible trust with each other. Like, so if something doesn't go well, you feel very secure in putting it out there and working it through. You know what I mean? And uh, and also we acknowledge each, each other's skill sets. You know what I mean? We know what where we do best. You know what I mean? And and we learn from each other. And so I think I think that part of that foundation is what sort of like helped to create that environment as well. And and, and other environments and other concert experiences. And also the food thing, you know, uh, the Jazz Project did this whole series about um, uh, celebrating different Southern states, right? And and we hired this incredible uh, sh- uh, soul food chef. She would cook the food of that particular region or area. You know what I mean? So it's like all of it, all of it sort of like, and all those experiences uh, sort of make us feel like we're a family and that we can trust each other, we can fight, we can, you know, we can disagree, but, but the end result is what's the most important thing. Like, and also the artists. Artists to us were like 
gold, you know, and you have to treat the artist well, you know, and whatever they need, you know, um, work it out and make sure that they feel they're their best selves when they are about to present their, their, their music, their work, their art. I remember I remember one one thing really clearly from that evening. Um, I remember that uh, Hrumpilez has a tradition of gathering in a prayer circle uh, before. And I was thinking to myself, well, my denomination is Zen, Buddhist, Baptist, Hasidim. And uh, <laughs> I, don't, you know, I don't know what anybody else believes. But uh, I'm definitely someone who has spirituality, not denominationalism. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, those moments are sometimes a little awkward depending on how, how dogmatic they get. But as soon as they started saying the Our Father, I don't speak Portuguese, but I understood every word. <laughs> and I started feeling kinship and spirituality. And it was, I just remember that that was a very sacred moment too for anyone, regardless of what you do not believe, that moment of gathering together and reaffirming uh, the spiritual nature of what we were doing. And I'll never forget that. Well, it, it definitely emanated out to the audience as well. Um, yes. the, the spirit was definitely in the house. And uh, again, you know, it was uh, it was really spectacular to experience. Uh, you know, here at WRTI, we felt honored to be part of uh, such a unique presentation. And you know, we've collaborated with the Philadelphia Jazz Project uh, on many uh, events. And you know, I like to feel myself as honorary Philadelphia Jazz Project. You know, because we've done so much together as far as collaborating. Well, you yeah. you were. You were more than honorary. <laughs> you were well, with us for the ride, the whole ride. <laughs> definitely with the food. Um, you know, the, the Philadelphia Jazz Project always found a way. Um, you know, like, like people who struggle all over this world find a way when they have to. And, and when it came to um, providing uh, whatever amenities that were necessary, Fluffy and Jazz Project always found, you know, interesting ways sometimes, but always, you know, they found a way and uh, to, to bring that presentation to Philadelphia, um, which is, uh, you know, again, this is the first time in the United States, New York and Philly, you know, that Orchestra Rupalese takes place. So for Philadelphia Jazz Project, you know, and WRTI and, you know, others, on the periphery that played a role in bringing that to, to Philadelphia. You know, it means a lot. And, and here at the station, it meant a lot to us, and it still means a lot to us. So, you know, Eric, again, kudos to you, my friend, um, for, for those inaugural steps that, that took place to make it happen. And, and uh, you know, to Otoro and, and Steven, you know, your efforts to, um, to, to dig deep within yourself and connect with such a wonderful spirit as that orchestra. Um, and thank you, thank you all for, for your efforts. And, and Julia, my homegirl, you know, it's it's always great. And, and you've done, you know, wonderful work over the years, and I'm sure there's many more to come. Yes. It was really phenomenal. Um, I, I thank all of you. Oh, thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you, guys. It's so beautiful thank to you, see Eric. you all today. Yes. Right. It was really great to see you again. Part, part two is next Friday. So okay. we get uh, we get two weekends in a row of this, this amazing. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, uh, All right. So right, great bye -bye. to see Take you. Care. Nice All to right. see you, Steve. Steve uh, I'm going to email you. Bye. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.